Good morning, New Life. Glad you're all here. Let's uh, stand if you're able, and we'll sing only a holy God. Team. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Life He Free. So glad that you are here with us this morning. Grab your bulletin, if you would, please. We have a, a special day and a special week ahead of us, and I would like to uh, remind you of uh, what we have coming up. Today, as I'm sure you have noticed, is our Operation Christmas Child uh, packing party. Uh, much has been said leading up to today, and so I will stick to the basics since the day is here. Uh, we will be ending our service a little bit early this morning. Uh, lunch will be served at 1145. You are welcome to join us for that time. You need not have brought anything. Everything is provided for lunch today. Uh, if you need to leave or if you have people coming to pack, 1230 is our start time. Even if you eat really fast, we will wait, and we're going to start right at 12.30. Uh, for those who do stick around and pack boxes, if you would be willing to stay till the end, till we pack all 400, uh, we need to do some pretty significant reshuffling of this room, moving chairs, taking tables out, and moving of all of the boxes into our entryway. And the, the efforts here are for the outreach coming up, and the moving of the boxes is to help people who are taking them to Marshalltown. So just keep that in mind if, if many could stick around to the end. Speaking of that outreach time, if you would look down in your announcements, uh, kind of towards the middle there, this uh, Saturday is that event, November 18th, 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Last time I checked, I saw my wife kind of talking with some this morning, but last time I looked, we need at least three more people in the kitchen, and we need at least 18 people to run games. So we have significant needs. If you have not signed up for that, it's one of those events that 
I really think is kind of an all hands on deck event, kind of like a VBS. Uh, something as big as this happening on Saturday, we need good help. So uh, if you'd be willing to do that, just to lend a hand for those couple hours on Saturday, that would be wonderful. We expect, if it's like last year, to have about 200 people come through from the community. The Christmas story, the gospel, is going to be shared, and all of us who are running games and serving lunch are just helping to facilitate movement towards uh, that gospel and also just building relationships. So we'd love to have you help out on Saturday. Also on Saturday, just one announcement down, and this is not conflicting in terms of the time. If you would have a heart to do both, that would be wonderful. We have the outreach here, and then we have the holiday stroll over in Marshalltown. And if you'd be willing to help uh, Paul and Mary with some serving of hot chocolate there as they hand out gospel tracks. You can read about all that information there in your bulletin and talk to them this morning as well. Last couple things I want to mention, uh, both youth ministry and prayer are back on for this Wednesday evening. And then don't forget, we have Eternity Bound coming soon in just uh, two weeks from today. They will have the entire 1030 service, uh, our own Brian Hempe and Jason Hempe and their wonderful singing group as they uh, sing the glory and praises of our Lord Jesus uh, that morning. It would be wonderful. I only regret that I will miss it, but uh, those of you who will be here will, will be blessed by that. We look forward to it. Uh, Connie has our scripture and prayer this morning. As he comes, would you give your attention to the reading of the word and join him as he leads in prayer? Thank you, Connie. Good morning. And my scripture just went away. Okay, if you're reading along, we're going to Acts 11, starting in verse 19, the church in Antioch. Uh, this, by the way, will be the scripture uh, reference for Steve's message this morning, so don't lose it. Uh, Acts eleven nineteen. <clears throat> now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, uh, who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all, to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him <coughs> to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Join me in a word of prayer. My Lord and my God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being my Lord and my God. Lord, I thank you for uh, the things that you do for us. Thank you for the excitement that comes from knowing you and through serving you. And Lord, we think of, of our time this morning after the service in, in preparing these boxes to go out to children around the world. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, allow us to, to participate in, the, in that ministry and, and, and other ministries of the church. But Lord, today our focus is on 
Operation Christmas Child, and we thank you for the opportunity. Lord, I pray for Steve this morning as he brings the word, brings a message to us that you would give us ears to ears, hear, and hearts to believe uh, your truth from your word. And Lord, uh, we ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, if you'd stand again and join us with, Lord, I need you, which I was reminded after I made a mistake on that last song that I really need the Lord, no doubt.
Savior lives and reigns forevermore. So I will go wherever He is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in Him. I give my heart. Be seated. Thank you, worship team. Uh, grab your Bibles, if you would, and join me, please, in Acts chapter 11. Acts 11. Now, let me explain why we are not turning to the book of Malachi and continuing our series there. I think I have uh, very rarely done this um, in, the, in the last few years here, but I decided kind of about midweek to go a different direction with our study this morning. I was at the Simeon Conference in Des Moines uh, all week long. Those days are very full days. Um, I leave the hotel at about um, uh, 7.45, and we go from about 8 in the morning to about 4.30 in the afternoon in that conference. So I, I just started getting the sense uh, as the week went on that I wasn't going to be able to give the time to the next Malachi passage that I really wanted to. Our next passage in Malachi that we are scheduled to study is about marriage. <laughs> and it's a, it's a topic that I just decided I, I want to give a normal week's preparation to this, and so that was a, a factor in my decision. And then the other factor was just our particular morning today, what, what we have in front of us today and, frankly, this whole week. Uh, our service is going to be shortened today, so the message needs to be shortened. And I just did not want to do that with the topic of marriage um, and our series in Malachi. So, Lord willing, we will pick up our series in Malachi next Sunday. And, by the way, in case... You're like me, and, and your mind immediately goes to schedule. We are still on schedule to, to finish Malachi on Christmas Eve day, which is a Sunday this year. So with that, uh, with that said, let me say also that what we are doing today and this week, this coming Saturday in particular, offers a unique opportunity for us to talk about the topic of gospel advancement, gospel advancement. With Operation Christmas Child, the Christmas Community Outreach next week, we have a unique week here at New Life focused on the advancement of the good news of Jesus Christ both globally today and next Saturday um, afternoon and evening uh, locally gospel advancement. So that's going to be our focus today in the study of God's Word. You are in Acts chapter 11, I hope, and as Connie said earlier, uh, he read from there, and hopefully you kept your place there. This week at the conference, the Simeon uh, Trust Conference, we had roughly 100 men there, give or take a few. And of course, when you are in a setting like that, it's very interesting to learn about the different churches that are represented there. One guy that I met for the first time goes to the Efri Church in Algona, Iowa. Anybody ever been to Algona? A few of you up north. He fills the pulpit in several small churches in that area. He actually works in Christian radio. He was a very interesting and, and nice man. I spent a good bit of time talking to a pastor at an e-free church in a, in a town just a few miles north of us, and we talked a lot just about the ups and downs in their church right now. 
Last year, I met a pastor uh, of a church in all places uh, in the small town of Baxter, not far from here. Wonderful uh, young man, and I got to see him again. There are pastors there representing churches, a lot of them from Minnesota, some from Missouri, even some from South Dakota. One guy I spoke to attends the Efree Church in, and by the way, I, I'm mentioning Efree guys, it's, it's more than just Efree guys, but many of them are. I met a guy that attends the Efree Church in Orange City, Iowa. And he told me about how 200 college students in that area started attending their Bible study that their church does for college-age students just like that. They had about 25, 30 coming, and then boom, 200. And we just talked about the interesting dynamics of that and challenges of that, but also, of course, excitement and blessings of that. Each of these churches, all of them that I interacted with and all those that I did not, all of them have their own reputation and legacy. Each of them have things that are going well and things that are a struggle right now. Each of them have areas of strength as a church and areas of weakness. Each church has a unique legacy that God is creating and leaving through their ministries. As we open the pages of the New Testament... There is a particular local church that has a legacy that any church at that conference, any of us, would love to have for our local church. It's a local church in Acts that has been talked about and written about time and time again as a wonderful, positive example to look towards, and that church is what Connie read about earlier, and it's what we call the Church of Antioch. Antioch. The church we're looking at today from Acts chapter 11, it's in front of you, I hope. Connie read it earlier. We look at it more in depth now. There is a reason why so many studies and speakers and authors address Antioch and the church there. It's a model church in the book of Acts. In fact, Luke, the author of Acts, especially highlights this church among all the early churches. <laughs> We're going to see that God used this one local church in incredible ways. All of us would want to be a part of a church like this that has a legacy of Antioch. By the way, here's a picture of what you will find today if you visit Antioch, which is in the country of Turkey today. Uh, this is what they have done with the cave that is near that city, and it is said that the church, now just keep this in mind, this, the church that we are talking about today first started to meet in this cave. That's the, that's the local account and, and history of, of that place. It's memorialized with a place you can still go see today. In a similar way, I was thinking this week, if you travel around our country, you will even see churches today named after the Church of Antioch. Antioch Church, First Antioch Church, Antioch Bible Church, whatever. By the way, I was also thinking this week, you're not going to find many First Church of Corinths. <laughs> Why? Uh, there's a reason for that, a lot of issues going on with the Corinthian church. Why do we still use Antioch today? Even in our names, how we name our churches. What did Antioch do that is so commendable? What can we learn from this church that gained such a long-lasting, positive legacy? Today we're going to look at, uh, very briefly, two passages in Acts, one of them has already been read for us, that speak to the church in Antioch. There are other brief mentions of believers in Antioch in the New Testament, but these two, far and away, that we're going to look at 
are the most thorough and intimate looks at this truth. Acts 11, and then we'll jump over to Acts 13. So we'll be very close uh, in both places to each other. We're going to study these texts with the question in mind, what can we learn from what they are doing that gains such a positive legacy? And folks, what we are going to see, I'm just going to tell you now, what we are going to see is that the church in the ancient city of Antioch very quickly learned to prioritize gospel advancement. Out of obedience to the Lord's call, they committed themselves to advancing the good news of Jesus Christ. And, listen please, they learned to do that in a way that involved self-sacrifice. Advance the gospel with sacrifice. That's kind of our main idea this morning. Let's pray together and then we will look at this incredible church and challenge ourselves to consider what we can learn from them. Father, thank you for this special day, really this special week ahead of us, where we are in uh, unique ways making an effort to advance the gospel. We are serving lunch Saturday. We are having some games, but at the heart of this is the ability that we will have to many or to few to proclaim the meaning of Christmas, the incarnation of Jesus. The Messiah has come. We rejoice in those who are making an effort that same evening in Marshalltown and handing out the good news, interacting with people, supporting that with a hot beverage. <laughs> and we are excited today to pack shoe boxes that will go with the good news of Jesus literally around the world to other countries, to other nations, other peoples. So thank you that's all uh, for all that is ahead of us. Strengthen us, help us to do these things with joy, um, and help us to do these things for the glory of the name of Jesus including, Lord, would you just encourage us through this message today. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let's begin by taking a look at this special church, and we're going to talk about first Antioch's backstory, okay? We need to understand uh, this information at the first stop in order to really feel the impact at the second stop, okay? So you are in Acts 11, but let's begin with this point, a little bit more of the backstory. We need to remember Stephen and the stoning of Stephen first. It's kind of a good starting point. This book of Acts begins with the followers of Jesus centered in the city of what? Where do they start? Jerusalem. That's where the disciples were when Jesus died and rose again. That's where they were when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Jerusalem is where all the followers of Jesus continued to gather and where they worshiped together. That just became the center, the hub for the first church. But then comes Acts 7. And you can flip there if you want. We're not going to read from it, but you can skim if you want to. Acts 7. And one of the believers there is murdered by the Jewish religious leaders, and his name is Stephen, with a PH. <laughs> I like the V on the view. So this is Stephen with a PH. And our focus for today is not so much the account of Stephen's death, but the effects of his death, okay? The immediate effects of his murder literally, this is not an overstatement, is one of the great turning points in church history. Listen to Acts 8.1. You might have it in front of you. It's also on the screen. And Saul, of course we know this is Saul Paul, approved of Stephen's execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
the 12. Listen, folks, after Stephen died, great persecution arose against the church, and that acted as an explosion, if you will, that scattered the believers across that region. They are scattered on that day to other countries and areas of what we now call the Middle East. Now, with that reminder, we are ready for the birth of the church in Antioch, okay? You are in chapter 11. I want to read, uh, reread a portion of it. Look at verse 19, Acts eleven nineteen. Now, those who were scattered, notice it picks up right at that scattering, because of the persecution over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus, and here it is, Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. We see in these verses that some of the disciples who were scattered from Stephen's death landed in a city called Antioch. By the way, Antioch is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It was the capital city of the Roman province in that time of Syria. It was a big city, estimated population of about 500,000, which is the size of Kansas City, Missouri. Pretty big. It was home to all kinds of people. It was a busy city, lots of different cultures. It was a dark city. Uh, we mentioned Corinth earlier. One author says, quote, Antioch is second only in wickedness to Corinth. <laughs> it's a wicked city, dark city. All kinds of cultures, which meant all kinds of false gods who were worshipped there, Greek gods, Roman gods, pagan gods. The most popular in the city was the Greek figure Daphne, whose worship involved some very immoral practices. So Antioch is a very big place, a very spiritually dark place, but a great opportunity for the gospel, right? And the early believers recognized that. Verse 19 says that some of the scattered believers spoke the word or the good news of Jesus to the Jews there in Antioch. But then 20 comes along and tells us that a couple of them, nameless heroes in the Bible, begin to speak the gospel to the Greeks there as well. And notice in 21, God's hand is with them. A great number of the Greeks there in Antioch believed in Christ for salvation. And so we have the birth of a what? A group of believers called the church. The church. And by the way, don't miss that little footnote that Connie read. First called what in Antioch? Christian. Isn't that interesting? So we have a church there, a fruitful one, a growing one, a great, think about this, a great number of people in a city the size of Kansas City are coming to believe upon Christ. This is wonderful. And so watch what begins to happen in verse 22. Look at verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came, he saw the grace of God. He was glad. He exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord, implied under his ministry. So Barnabas went to Tarsus and looked for Saul, Paul. And when he had found them, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church, taught many people, and in Antioch they were first called. Christians. When I was growing up, my mom uh, received the Des Moines Register at our home. This is back in the day when the sports section, you remember what color it was, some of you? The peach, the big peach. So I used to, to love getting up in the morning and I'd have my bowl of, of cereal, uh, actually bowls, plural, 
and <laughs> reading the paper. And I've always, I would always start with the sports section, of course, and then kind of move to the comics. And if I had time, I'd get to like the entertainment section. And so you look in the sports section and there was this little section, do you remember this, called transactions. And it would talk about baseball players who were put on the disabled list or trades that happened in the NBA or Major League Baseball, whatever. Got a couple transactions here in this text that we just read transactions. The news of the growth of the church in Antioch reached back to the believers who stayed in Jerusalem. Remember, this included the 12. They had stayed. And so at that news, they decide to send who? Let's send Barnabas, transaction number one, to go and encourage and teach the new believers there. That's transa uh, transaction number one. But then notice at the end of 24, then a great many people were added to the Lord. They're growing even more. And so since Barnabas arrived, and as a result of his ministry, they just kept going, and now he needed help, right? And so 25 is transaction, uh, transaction number two. Barnabas goes and finds who? Saul Paul and brings him to Antioch. By the way, he's now a believer. Okay, we skipped that part. But Barnabas gets Paul, he comes to Antioch to help carry the ministry load. Now, that's the backstory of Antioch. You get a pretty good picture of what's going on there, who's involved. That is Antioch's backstory. We need to fast forward a bit to get to the next picture. So turn with me, if you would, please, to chapter 13. Maybe you don't even need to turn a page. I don't. Look at Acts 13. And now we're going to see their legacy, okay? Now we're going to get their legacy. Look at verse 1, 13, 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, we know he was there, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, Paul, we know he was there. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Let's talk about this little update that Luke gives us on the church in Antioch. Write this down. We see here that a team is sent. A team is sent. Luke begins by listing for us some of the names of the prophets and teachers in the church. Five of them are named. By the way, just a totally just a little side note here. It's very interesting to me to note that there are scholars who believe that this Simeon, do you see that name again, mentioned in verse 1, is Simon of Cyrene, who helped carry the cross of Jesus. Very interesting, just possibility, okay? So we have this list of guys who are leading and ministering in the church, five solid guys, impressive list, impressive staff, if you will, and notice, according to verse 2, they were on this occasion worshiping the Lord and fasting. Now, I, I think that those doing this were at least these five guys listed, but likely more. Let's just say the church was doing this, okay? They are worshiping and fasting. It would seem that they here are, are, are seeking the Lord's direction, and of course, a word from the Lord comes, doesn't it? Look at verse 2 again. Holy Spirit says, interesting, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Lord says, see to it that these two men pursue a different work and opportunity. Now, how would you feel in the church if that came down? <laughs> How's the church going to respond? Well, um... You know, Lord, 
you see, the, these two guys are really important here. <laughs> Paul leads a Sunday school class. He's working with our elders and leaders. Uh, good old Barnabas kind of leads our deacons and deaconesses. He leads a small group he teaches. Th these are really important men here, Lord. I I'm not sure that we can give them up. Is that how they're going to respond? Or, or how about, what about Stan and Bill instead? <laughs> we, can, we can spare them. Is that how they responded? We saw it. Look at verse 3 again. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on those two men and sent them off. <laughs> the Lord said, let them go do the work I have for them, and they obediently respond. They lay their hands on them, which was like kind of a commissioning, if you will, and they send them off to do the work. Now, what's the work? Before we move on here, what's the work? That's key. If we were to continue to read the book of Acts, we get the answer. We come to see that Barnabas and Saul are sent out to do what? To advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. They go on their first great missionary journey, and then Paul, separate from Barnabas, goes on to more in the book. They're traveling around to the nations, being a witness for the gospel, starting new churches. They are making disciples of Jesus Christ. And at the call to the church in Antioch to release them to do this, they respond in obedience. We have read our text for today. As we begin to wrap up this morning, let's talk about this last section here. We're going to call it Antioch's Legacy their legacy, and today. We've looked at their backstory, how the church came to be. We've looked at their mission. God called them to send out these two men. They did it. Now, what does all of this mean? And what can we learn from their example? Let me share two thoughts with you as we close. Can I do that with you? Two thoughts, each containing, I think, valuable application for us. Write this down, first of all. The church in Antioch was obedient to God's command to advance the gospel. They were obedient to God's word to advance. We saw it in the text today. He came to the church in their prayer, in their fasting, tells them to send out two of their best for the purpose of advancing the gospel to the nations, and they do it. They said, yes, we will obey the voice of the Lord. Our priority, our priority, will match God's priority to advance the gospel. Folks, listen, this is touching on the center of why they have a positive legacy, even in our day today. I think we need to just pause a moment here and consider what a significant thing this is, that this is happening from Antioch, and not some other place. Realize that if we said, boy, th th there's a church in church history that was the first local church gathering to send out missionaries to advance the gospel, if you didn't know who we were talking about, we would probably assume it was who? Jerusalem, would you agree? A lot of quietness at that question. Jerusalem, I would propose to you. That's what we would assume. Oh, Jerusalem was the ones who sent out first missionaries. After all, that's where the church started. That's where the apostles stayed. But it wasn't, was it? According to Luke and Acts, it was the church of Antioch that first sent out people to other nations to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Antioch, wicked city of Antioch. And yet from there, the church first sent out people for gospel advancement in, in obedience to the Lord's call. It's significant because it represents a shift. A shift from Jerusalem to Antioch being the center and the hub of gospel advancement. Warren Wearsby puts it this way. He writes, until now, 
Notice the shift. Until now, Jerusalem had been the center of ministry, and Peter had been the key apostle. But from this point on, Antioch in Syria would become the new center, and Paul, the new leader, the gospel was on the move. Okay, I like that at the end. Antioch becomes the hub of the gospel moving forward. Now, that's all observed in the text. What about today? What about today? How does the legacy of Antioch encourage Christians and churches in our day? Well, let's first of all say this. There is something that we need to guard against. Can I just start there? There is something that we need to guard against. There is a subtle danger in this thought that we are seeing in the text that we need to be aware of. And that is the thought of what I'm going to call chalking it up to thumbprints chalking it up to thumbprints. Now, let me explain what I mean by that, okay? Larry Austin has worked with our E-Free Central District for uh, several years now. Uh, he's a wonderful man. He's been an encouragement to me in, in several different ways over the years. He was at the conference this week, Larry Austin. And Larry said in a meeting that I was once at, I don't even remember the occasion, but he said, quote, every church has a unique thumbprint. <laughs> every church has a unique thumbprint. What he meant by that is that though our mission and our core beliefs are the same, each church has a unique way that God uses them. If we had people from Valley Church, our largest church in the district, I think, in West Des Moines, if we had them sitting in this front row, uh, Pastor Quinton would come up here and, and we would quickly realize we're on mission together, the same mission. We have similar beliefs, but boy, our churches have different thumbprints. Do you understand what I'm saying? We look different. God uses us in different ways. Every church has unique dynamics and ministry burdens and passions. They do things differently. Every church has a unique thumbprint. But listen, folks, the danger with our example from the church in Antioch is just to simply chalk it up to thumbprint. In other words, we can be tempted to think, well, that, that was their thumbprint. Uh, Antioch was just kind of a missions church. <laughs> you ever heard that? Someone say that? They're just one of those churches that kind of had a unique desire to emphasize world missions. Or, or they were just one of those churches that focused on the gospel in their community. That's nice, but we're not going to have the same thumbprint in my church or in any church. Every church is different. That's a thought that we need to reject, folks. We cannot relegate, listen carefully, please. We cannot relegate gospel advancement to an optional activity in the church. Every church, every gathering of followers of Jesus needs to prioritize gospel advancement in their community and around the world. And you say, Steve, you're sounding very strong. Why, why, how, and why are you saying these things? Let me remind you, let me remind us of our call, believer. God came to those fasting and praying in Antioch with a call to gospel advancement. Here is likewise our Earlier in the same book that we're looking at, the Lord Jesus said himself to his followers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you will be my witnesses here and in the country next to you and around the world. Just days earlier, he had said to his followers, captured by Matthew, go, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Go and make disciples. To the Corinthian church, Paul spoke of believers being 
ambassadors for Christ. That's who we are. That's our identity, which means engagement. An ambassador of the United States engages the people out there in that other country. We are called to engage for the sake of the name of Christ. Peter writes that we should always be ready to give an answer to people who ask us, hey, what, what's, why, why are you so hopeful? <laughs> and to the hope that they observe in us, which we, we know is Christ. And in Philippians 1, Paul says, I rejoice in the advance of the gospel. Even when it means people are taking advantage of me in prison, I rejoice because the gospel is blazing a trail in Rome. Philippians 1. Listen, loved ones, here's the point. This is not just some nice passion or burden that the church of Antioch had. It's not just their unique thumbprint. Oh, good for them. They were excited about advancing the gospel. Maybe my church will, or maybe we'll focus on something else. Now listen, loved ones, advancing the gospel is our call from the Lord Jesus himself. Our call is to make disciples of all nations. Our call is to be ambassadors of Christ in the environments that he has placed you in, believer. Our call is to be ready to give an answer for the hope that people see displayed in us. That is our command, and we must live that out. Let me just say as we wrap up this first point, let me just say, if, if you have chosen or are choosing new life to be your church home, uh, you, you need to understand that gospel advancement is something that we are going to prioritize as a church. If you choose to worship here, you have chosen to be a part of a church body that started eight years ago by prioritizing this, and we are going to continue. It's a call that's not just for new church plants to do, as we were, but it's something that all healthy churches need to continue to prioritize. If you choose this as your church home, you are going to be confronted with encouragement to personally advance the gospel in your life, in your circles. And if you are here, you are going to be confronted with corporate opportunities to be involved together in gospel advancement. If you are choosing new life as your church home, you are choosing a church that is going to lean into, by God's grace, obedience to this call. Like Antioch, we want to leave a legacy to the future generations of being a church that advance the gospel in Tama Toledo and Traer and Belle Plaine and Montour and Marshalltown, fill in the blank. By the way, the ways that we do that, and I think this is important just to, to talk about as, as, a, as a body, as a family, the, the ways that we do that may change. They have changed from our first few years, and they will continue to change. I don't mean to imply anything by this. I almost hesitate to say it, so don't read into this, please. But the day may come where we no longer pack shoeboxes. Again, I don't, I'm not implying anything there. We are very excited that we're doing it. But the day may come for some reason where we don't do that. The day may come where we don't do the community Christmas outreach. Some years we participated in the Stoplight Festival in Toledo. The last couple of years we have, have not. How we do it may change, but you need to know about our church that it is going to be, by God's grace, a priority for us. We want to encourage you to be a witness in your work, in your home, in your family Thanksgiving, in your kids' activities, and in your neighborhood, and we together are going to continue to make efforts to engage our community in relationship and in proclamation of the gospel. Like Antioch, 
we want to prioritize obedience to the Lord's call in his word to go and advance the good news of Christ. Our second and final thought on Antioch is this, and then we are done. We'll be brief with this one. Write this down, though. I think it's important to note the church in Antioch was sacrificial in their obedience to this call. Sacrificial. A key point. I love this about the church. The church of Antioch willingly and selfishly sent their best. <laughs> sent their best. Think about it. What, what good, what fruit could have come? if Paul and Barnabas had stayed and continued to work there. They sacrificed months and even years of fruitful ministry in their church and their city for them to go and take the gospel to somebody else. They didn't say, oh, let's, let's send Stan and Bill. We can spare them. Because if they go, we won't lose ground on the ministry here. It's not what they said. They willingly, obediently sent two of their best as the Lord had asked. In fact, I love this. That phrase, if you're still in 13, verse 3, do you see this at the end of verse 3? That phrase, sent them off. Do you see that? That phrase, sent them off, in excuse me, the original Greek means released them. I love the image there, released them for the work. These two men had been very key leaders in the early days of this church here in Antioch, encouraging, teaching, witnessing in their city. And yet in obedience to God's call, they released them for the work in order to go reach others, the nation. There's a good lesson for us in there, I think, folks. Is, is our advancement of the gospel involving sacrifice? Just ask yourself, is, our, is, is my effort to advance the gospel involving sacrifice? For you to advance the gospel, believer, it will and should involve sacrifice. It's going to involve a sacrifice of time and your schedule. You invest in that relationship with a non-believer. You have them over to your house or you go out to the Mexican restaurant together. So you build a relationship. With them. It's sacrificing your time and your schedule. Sometimes our gospel advancement is going to involve financial sacrifice. I love that our OCC team of ladies who, uh, if I forget to say this later, thank you to our ladies who have put in so much work towards the day. I love that our OCC team of ladies here at New Life has a heart to make sure that we are sending quality items in the boxes. I love that. I love that heart. That the gospel we are sending being complemented by quality items. That, that's a financial sacrifice. Are we as a church sacrificing for the sake of gospel advancement? Are you individually, believer, sacrificing for the sake of gospel advancement? I close with this. I mentioned that Antioch became this hub of, of gospel advancement in their day, the center kind of out of which things flowed. Pastor Bob Cosbo is the pastor over at the Efree Church, Grace in Marshalltown. I remember Pastor Bob often, multiple times, telling the story of when he was growing up in a, in a little church in Gilbert, Iowa. Gilbert, just north of Ames. We have some people from Gilbert in our church. The Rickards are from Gilbert. He, Bob, uh, tells the story of how his youth pastor, now this is back in the I don't know, late, late 70s, early 80s, his youth pastor growing up told the students, there is no reason why Gilbert, Iowa cannot be the hub of the universe. <laughs> kind of interesting thought, isn't it? 
What does he mean? He meant there's no reason why God cannot make this one, at that time, little community one of his primary places to send out of, to send the gospel out of. Support missionaries, send missions teams, witness to our community in Gilbert and in Ames, send out pastors, send out missionaries. And then Bob, whenever he would tell this story, he would always reference how God actually did that. He actually did that in ways that they could see and notice. And many from that generation in Gilbert did become people who were committed with their lives, some in full-time ministry, some in not, but they ended up committing their lives to follow Christ and set their hearts on honoring Him and to advance the gospel. And by the way, I will testify, I have met a handful of adults now, they're probably in their around 60 or so, who grew up in Gilbert with Bob, passionately following Jesus Christ. Gilbert became a hub, in a sense, just like the Church of Antioch. And folks, why I'm sharing this to you is to say there is no reason why Tama Toledo cannot be a hub of God's gospel activity. A hub where 400 shoeboxes go out of today. A hub where people who live here decide, nah, let's just leave our home next Saturday and let's just check out a few of these Christmas things going on around the community. And they come here and they hear the gospel. A hub where men and women are raised up to give their lives to missions, foreign missions. A hub where young men are raised up to give their lives to pastoral ministry. There is no reason why Tema Toledo should not and cannot be a hub like that. With the grace of God, of course. And as we enter this special week of gospel advancement here at New Life, be reminded that this is a priority for us. I hope you see that just in the fact of what we're doing. By the grace and help of God, we are committed to do this like the church in Antioch. May the Lord help us to be obedient to him, to advance the gospel as he calls us to, And may the Lord give us grace to leave a legacy like that of Antioch. Worship team, would you come? I will pray. We're going to close with a song, and then I will pray for our lunch and uh, give a few instructions as well. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this great example of the church in Antioch. Uh, There is a reason why we still name churches after them. We talk about them, we write about them in in glowing terms, and I hope today we have been reminded of why. They obediently prioritized the spread of the gospel, and in that they sacrificed. And we didn't even hit on just the little paragraph where they took up an offering and sent it to believers in Jerusalem. They were thinking of others for salvation and for encouragement and and building up and, and even just supplying of other believers in other communities. Thank you for this group. Thank you for those two nameless men, or I I shouldn't say two and I shouldn't say men, this, this small group of believers who started talking to the Greeks as well. We don't even know who they were, but they prioritized advancing, and then the whole church did it. Lord, thank you for this example, and I pray that we here at New Life, Tama Toledo, would be encouraged to go and do likewise. We stand out and, and just close by singing your praise, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray.
Would you stand with me, please? Thank you. Worship team, let's sing together. seated just for a brief second. Uh, just a quick update on Saturday and the, the outreach here. We are looking for one person to help with lunch. You don't need to bring any food. It's just serving lunch. And then about 10 still for games. Okay, we've got our Christmas story reader covered. We've got our greeter at the door covered. Um, and everything else covered, but those are our needs still. So Amy has the sign-up sheet. Um, you can see her. We'd love to get that filled in. Uh, oh, and, and we also could use just a few more prizes, so just small, like candy, as they do the game. You give them a piece of candy or something. So if you would like to uh, donate anything along those lines, you can see her as well. Um, I think this, I, I s well, I'm going to wait on that. I think all of our ladies are out of the room at the moment. So uh, I, I, would, I do want to thank those ladies. They provided the lunch for us. And Linnell um, took care of the sandwiches that you're going to eat from Subway, I believe. So uh, Linnell did all of the ordering and picking up. In fact, she's probably getting them right now. So we said 11.45 is when we're going to eat. We're a few minutes ahead of that, but you can make your way back there. I will pray for lunch right now. And eat at the pace that you want to eat, but <coughs> if you get done early, we're, we will start the packing right at 1230, okay? Even if everybody's in here and kind of twiddling their thumbs, we will, we will wait because we might have friends and family coming at that time, okay? All right, let me pray. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we thank you uh, for this time we've had to worship, to hear your word. Thank you for this time now just to eat a meal together and share that time, and of course, we look forward to uh, about 50 minutes from now uh, starting to pack these boxes. We give you praise, and we love you, and thank you for our Savior, Jesus, the Messiah, uh, the one who has victory over sin and death. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 